Isn't that great? I get to actually make two bounce on the stage introductions. That's wonderful. Anyway, hello everyone. Let's see if I can make sure that I keep this at the appropriate volume for what we have here. My name is Jason Scott. Uh, I'm various things. Most of the time now I just call myself flat out a digital historian because at this point I'm collecting way too much stuff of way too much variety. But I'm normally known as the textfiles.com guy, a person who runs an archive of bulletin board system texts, which has now expanded into all sorts of realms of computer history and subcultures. What this means is that everything you delete, I keep. Everything you post, I keep. I've gotten some wonderful letters, heartfelt letters, telling me to please delete stuff. And the only thing I delete is that letter. Anyway. So um, this music video I shot indicates kind of a direction that I've gone in in the past few years, which is to move into the realm of video production. Specifically, uh, I started to get an idea that besides the artifacts, the straight-on artifacts that I collect here, um, which are basically text files, it's good if you can to get some of the historical and human perspective besides it. So I always make an effort when I can to meet people and know the people behind it. And I've been very lucky over the past, oh, eight years or so, talking directly to people who I previously only thought of as words on a page or on a box or otherwise in some way completely uh, in the realm of mythos, which disappears when you're in their kitchen. So, um, this talk is called Making a Text Adventure Documentary, which gives away the fact that I'm making a text adventure documentary. So, I'm going to quickly ask, um, how many people here knew I was working on one? Because there's a lot of people there. All right, I'll save you time. It's not ready yet. It'll be hopefully ready later this year, but I'll explain why it might be delayed beyond the usual controls. But I have shot pretty much every interview I could ever wish to shoot, and I'm in the process of editing, and this DEF CON pr uh, presentation allowed me to refine some of my uh, approaches, so hopefully it'll work a little bit quicker. So um, how many people here, and nobody's looking at you, uh, don't know what a text adventure is? All right, there's one person. They were awesome. Anyway, so... Um, just for the, for the uninitiated who are afraid to put their hands up. Text adventures are basically games that describe locations to you instead of portraying them graphically, which then ask you to type in either a short or long form sentence telling it what you then wish to do based on the description. At the end of that, procedure, you will either solve puzzles, that is to say obstacles put in your path, or you will simply travel along to the end and win. This is a very odd concept to get across to somebody who was born after Mosaic was created, because not very much now really uses a text interface exactly that way. You know, we certainly have text interfaces where we use mobile phones and stuff, and so yeah, you do that. And some people, of course, have found out through osmosis that there were these text adventures, and certainly one of the first applications that tends to get ported to any new platform is some sort of text adventure. Um, and so when I say text adventure, um, usually you have to say to people, Infocom, Zork, or adventure and people go oh I get it oh yeah I remember those which often they're lying they remember somebody mentioning them but Infocom was a company Zork was a product it was also a program adventure was a program and I'll talk a little bit about those uh, in a moment but that sort of fuzzy realm of memory is kind of what we all live in as as people we we don't really have to know all of it to get the gist and move on However, there are, of course, people who want to know more. And more importantly, to their great horror, they will find out that there's very little detail out there that isn't sort of copied from previous works. Um, I had the pleasure of sitting on my, on my Segway, and yes, I'm the Segway asshole, um, of sitting on my Segway at the corner of the Riv and listening to somebody have somebody else ask, so, you know, did you see Captain Crunch? And the person said, yes. And he said, you know what he did? And he goes, well, yeah, I think so. He goes, yeah. He worked with Steven Wozniak in college to create the blue box using a whistle. This is more true than not true, but it's not true. 
So, okay, all right, that sort of goulash of memory will work for you. And until he actually looks up the history and tries to find it, that's kind of what he's going to bring with him. But if we didn't have all these interviews of Wozniak and Crunch and other phone freaks, perhaps that history would be a little more dim and we wouldn't understand it. The fact that many people didn't know about Joe Agressia, who sadly died uh, just within this last year, um, just says that people might know phone freak history, but it's a kind of limited one. So same with text adventures. People will often talk about them as if they're this kind of like one or two programs that kind of came out and then kind of disappeared. Well, actually, the text adventure genre was in some, in some weeks, four to five of the top ten selling software titles of all types um, on any given week. Now, of course, this was the early 1980s, but these were extremely popular programs for what they were. And then they just kind of disappeared. Um, and didn't disappear. But anyway, so um, I previously made a documentary called BBS the Documentary, which some people know. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Those are the tired people who watched it last night off a of torrent. Just to mention torrents, by the way, uh, the entire documentary is Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike licensed, and so will this one be pretty much. It'll actually have to have non-commercial added to it, and I'll explain why in a moment. Um, but I'm really big on Creative Commons. Uh, I think sometimes it's overused, like any good tool, and I think sometimes people apply Creative Commons to places it shouldn't be, and they don't entirely understand it. But at the very least, they did the right thing. They created a simple-to-understand legal framework for people to release things under a copyright other than the copyright, which at this point has been kind of fortified with 11 vitamins and terrible anti-constitutional shit because everybody was scared that somebody was going to take away Leonard DiCaprio's paycheck. So the fact that there exists this other kind of alternate copyright that's kind of interesting uh, makes it so much easier for a person like myself. And one of the jokes I always get is people say, People who don't like me, a very small minority, um, say like, ha ha, I pirated your documentary. To which I say, no, you didn't. Because it's in there. Actually, there's a documentary that came out, a little piece of pro-pirate propaganda called Steal This Film 2. Um, which is, which is, yeah, which is very well done. It's better than the first one. But um, at the end of it, they copyrighted it. And they intentionally copyrighted it saying, so now you can steal it. So, anyway, I love that line. Anyway, so when I made BBS the documentary, it was in a dearth of real organic knowledge of people who made bulletin board systems. And when I did that, when I came up with the idea for that, it was about 2000. And at the time, I really felt describing it to my friends like I was a guy with a spoon going, I'm going to make a subway system. And there was a lot of doubt about that. And a lot of poor people had to uh, live through my, my constant talking about this project because obviously anything that consists of 205 interviews done over four years that results in 250 hours of footage, which then gets nailed down to seven hours of footage in eight episodes, is somebody who's probably pretty committed. And zealots are not fun to hang around. So I would talk about it a lot. But along the way, I learned these various skills. And I, I tell people, I, I finished this documentary. I made back everything I put into it within 20 days. I have sold enough. I've made six figures off it. I'm a happy boy. Don't worry about me. Of course, they are for sale still, $30 con special. But um, the, uh, the documentary was me saying, OK, well, nobody's done a BBS documentary. I'm going to do all of the BBS documentary. So it was tough, and, and I've gotten dinged on a few things, but it's all like, so having given away all this history, you failed at A, B, and C. And I'm like, that's why you're fat. <laughs> and don't move and don't do anything, because you wait till someone finishes the whale, and then you go, whale seems a little off color. Anyway, there are crypts in Italy full of the skulls of guys like that. Anyway, so there's... there's um, there's a lot that's not in the BBS documentary, so I've been taking all the raw footage and just dumping it up on archive.org, something I will be doing with this documentary as well. So don't think I suddenly went Hollywood or went independent, which is Hollywood minor, and, and suddenly started to go crazy on my stuff. So I'm not really like that, I'm, and so I can tell you right now that's that. I think when you're doing something like this, I think you're supposed to like drop factoids during it so they can get twittered. Anyway, so, um, so the question, of course, is why? Did I choose a documentary 
on text adventures. And what happened was, was after finishing the BBS documentary uh, and collapsing in a pool of blood, I thought, you know, what else affected my childhood? And there were two answers, um, text adventures and arcades. And I, so I said to myself, okay, well, arcades is too big right now. I will die. So I'm going to instead focus on, fuck you. I will, um, sorry. I'll do everything, but I will not let that fucking logo go on the screen. Anyway, so um, I said to myself, okay, well, you know, I'll do a little thing on text adventures. And my little thing is still pretty big. So when all was said and done, and at this point I consider myself pretty much done with filming, I have 85 interviews um, of people, and it comes out to about 120 hours of footage, and I've been slowly editing it, going through. Now, what I tell people is I liked everything about BBS the documentary except for the sound and the video. And the reason why is because I was kind of a dumb punk, and I used something called a Canon XL1, and I used a version 1 Canon XL1, which does not have XLR inputs, which is bad. I had to almost immediately buy an XLR input adapter, which was $180, and didn't work very well. The purpose of XLR, for anyone who cares, is that, among other things, it gives you a very, no a very low noise floor. floor. So uh, this was a, an adapter that lets you add XLR with a very high noise floor. Awesome. I want more of that. Fuck Canon. Anyway, so, of course, immediately after I purchased my camera, version 2 came out, had XLR right on the thing. So, yeah, all right, great. But I had already committed, and I'd paid my thousands, and so here I was. So I shot it in standard definition, and I shot it using uh, a boom mic a certain way, and it looks pretty good. I'm pretty happy with the editing, the approach, the editorial. But like I said, I think I didn't get the sound entirely well, and I didn't get the video particularly awesome. So this time around, I went ahead and I paid $6,000 for a a high definition camera. And yes, I'm shooting a documentary on text adventures in high definition. <laughs> so um, I just very quickly, just because, you know, people need it and look at them, they're walking off with a beer. They need a bar on the back of my stuff. You got to drink to listen to my shit. Um, I'm just going to quickly play something from, you know, this is kind of a put together set of footage. Um, this is from, this is primarily people from something called Infocom. Infocom was the probably the largest text adventure company uh, that ever existed, and they are considered to be the gold standard. And, of course, my documentary goes into extreme detail about Infocom. But what you're going to see here is these are guys who were in Infocom and kind of a cut between them, and you can kind of see how my footage looks and how they talk and everything else, and we'll see how this looks on this thing. And if you can't understand everything they say, don't worry. The movie's fully subtitled. If you don't subtitle your movie, you are a douche. It is basically free. So subtitle your movie. Subtitle your crap you upload to people. You know, I mean, it's just like there's free software out there now that makes it so easy. And it's not just for the deaf. People have kids. People can't hear voices very well, I have found out. If you're in this milky, muddy room, it's like, well, I guess he's saying something. His eyes sure look wild. Um, I suggested to Ashley that she subtitle... Hackers are people, too, very strongly. That seems to have worked out. So, anyway. One more. Let's see. Boop. It's going to do the thing, isn't it? And uh, what is an adventure game, and what makes it so uh, interesting for people? It's a, in a world right now where we're going to graphics a lot, it seems to be basic, based in words. And uh, what is it? Well, the wonderful thing about an adventure game that's based on words, of course, is that your brain probably can do a much better job of creating the pictures than the computer can with today's technology. And so our games are all text. You interact with the computer in words, and the computer spits words back out at you. In some ways, that, that maturity of the, of the form was, was an impediment because you knew that there were hundreds of thousands of people out there who had played these games, and they knew that you're supposed to be able to do certain things, and they expect the, the plot as such.
to move in certain ways. Oh yes, Infocom was one of the big one of the biggest ones. We had we would we would have three or four uh, games in the top twenty of soft sell all the time in eighty three, eighty four, eighty five. Uh, we were we were definitely one of the the more important publishers and possibly one of the most respected. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, I think the best example of that is is the character Floyd, the robot in Planetfall, you know, who at the time just, you know, completely impressed people as being such a a realistic and and deep and and character who they cared about. And um, and a couple of years ago, for a a talk that I was doing, I went and um, segregated all the code that had to do with the interaction between the player and Floyd, uh, and printed that out, and it was, uh, by recollection, is it was between five and ten, just eight and a half by eleven pages. You know, it's sort of a, you know, reasonable point size. To the best of my recollection, lawyers taught me to say that. Um, I thought it would be a software development house that could succeed on a small scale, at, at least. Just because the people involved, I knew the people involved so well, and uh, you know, I believed in their talent. A bunch of twenty-somethings putting every ounce of energy and time and creative effort into not only work but play and play together. I mean, we were all one family. It was really an amazing family of people. One day we were talking about the properties of Bakwano, and in the middle of it we stopped and said, no one's going to believe we actually discussed this at work. You know, what you could do with it, what happened to it, stuff like that. We had the best parties. We had the best hacks. We had the best softball team. We didn't take it very seriously, but we beat every other softball team in the, in software, including the Lotus guys who were all from the warehouse and all looked like they spent all day in the gym. Um, well, I mean, it kind of all happened so fast in, you know, in the space of, you know, less than a year going from, you know, working on my first game to collaborating with Douglas Adams. Now, the first time I came across this in, in modern times, I guess it was uh, uh, many years ago when I did a, a, a version of uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to Galaxy with a company called Infocom. I'll make an admission, actually. Um, I don't think that I finished a single Infocom game. Um, that tasteful vibe I was talking about was just so powerful with those games that there were people who would buy the games and play a little bit. Many people never finished the Infocom games, you know. We, uh, Mike Dornbrook, uh, the marketing uh, guru there, a very clever fellow, uh, put together a survey and he asked people, um, you, know, you know, how many Infocom games have you bought and how many have you played? And then he asked how many have you finished? And it turned out that people have never finished many of them. Uh, they just like to own them, you know. You know, who, who would have thought that we would try a, a, a romance and... and but, you know, I really wanted to try it, and, and Amy had a lot of fun with it, and Amy, Amy made it fun, and, and it, was ple- it was good to see that uh, some fans did like that. Um, I, I'm just thinking of, of your talking about um, the other imps, talking about how wonderful it was, and it, it really was. I mean, I, I can say, for me, it was a sad truth that it was the best job I've ever had and, and a job I don't think I could ever get again. It was a really... Not a job. It was an amazing creative experience with an amazing creative group. And I do think it was something very special and unusual. Oh, I'm always looking for another Infocom. And I know the other implementers are, too. Um, If if we could find a way to bring back what was really important about Infocom, I'm sure we would. Sometimes, though, I think it's because we won't give ourselves permission to do it. It would almost be a sacrilege to try and revive it or something, but... But if, I mean, I would jump instantly at a chance. All right. So um, I'm not going to explain the, the, the context of each of those people. Um, some of them, when I was interviewing Steve Moretzky, who's pretty much an interesting vector, he's both an absolute expert on text adventures, and he also, also made most of the really, really famous ones. He co-authored 
mostly authored Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. He did Planet Fall, Station Fall. He did um, Leather Goddesses of Phobos. When uh, Infocom went under, they moved to a company which created Spellcasting 101, 102, 103, uh, sorry, 201, 301, and so on. So he's both of that. And when I was interviewing him a couple times, he said, so who are you interviewing from Infocom? And I said, well, mostly the people whose names were on the box. And he said, wow, that is an enormous mistake. You have to interview John Pallas. And I was like, he's like, do you know who John Pallas is? I got that a lot. Do you know who X is? Nope. And that person then tells me everything I need to know and why I should. And, 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 and yeah, John Pallas was the producer for pretty much all the major Infocom games. So he's... The reason Stephen Moretzky loves him is because John Pallas' job was to keep all the suits out of Stephen Moretzky's face. And now that Stephen Moretzky has become, um, he's become a lead developer and he's become head of development, he now knows what it's like to constantly have the suits in his face. So he looks back with a new, new uh, uh, admiration for everything John Pallas did. So anyway, a couple people in there that were like that. Andrew Kazukalaki is the reason that Mind Forever Voyaging is able to fit on a 128K floppy because there was a whole big major issue with that and he was able to get extra bytes out. So he's beloved. At the time, he was 18 years old. He had written software for Synapse Software. So this was a guy who had that. Now, at this juncture, I say, as I watch people kind of storm out, um, you either go, holy shit, I want to see even more of this. Or you say, I have made an enormous scheduling error. What else is on the schedule? And that's fine. The point, the way to make a good movie is not to make it so it keeps all of you in a vague amount of attention. What I do is I try to make a movie that keeps a percentage of people in absolute rapt attention. That's, a, that's the only way you make a movie that really sticks in people's minds. Otherwise, you just end up with something that's kind of basically okay that you see on a little screen on your jet blue television and you forget about it two minutes after you walk off the plane. So when I'm working on this one, I'm going to obviously edit this a bit more. What you're seeing here are what are you know, more wide clips. I believe that the modern human can't really sustain more than 15 to 30 seconds of a person talking without any change in the shot before they start to freak out. It's a sad truth, but that's what you got. So I try to edit things up a bit more, but I just wanted you to have some senses of it. I'm going to play another quick sequence here. This one's more about a, an aspect of text adventures that people may not have actually uh, thought of that much. One moment. God, that's embarrassing. It's like having a wrinkle in my dress. Yeah, it's almost what is what is left unsaid, unrevealed. Uh, in a lot of cases, you don't know exactly what that dragon would look like, and I never would anyway. But to, you know, to have that gap where you fill in your conception of a dragon, it will be your ultimate dragon. I, you take stock of your positions. You're wearing a hat. You have one zip code. A financial link appears on your keyboard. By the way, you can check the amount of cash you're holding at any time with a cash demand, or just type a dollar followed by return. Buy. She just appears with a link. It's like you would pretend you would have magic, right? But you don't know what it's really like. I mean, you don't really know what it's like to have magic. I mean, you can read a lot about what's... You can read science fiction and, and sort of put yourself in the place of a telepathic or magical character. But you really don't know what it's like. And, and I think that's sort of the same. It's like playing to be sighted. I'm playing at being sighted. And it's weird. It's, a, it's funny playing games. Like I actually have to. That actually does trip me out sometimes. I have to, you know, in games you have to have like a lantern or a flashlight or something to provide a source of light. Mm -hmm. I don't think about that. It's like you go into a room. It's like it's pitch black. You can't see. And I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> you know, if if you play something like Zork, everything is described, and sighted people don't always do that. So. You not only here get a sense of place and how places work and how you move through them, 
but you also get a sense of objects. You can examine, you know, every it's pretty much everything you can pick up in that game, and it'll have a description. So it, it's very helpful. The thing about text adventures is they really help you build mental maps, especially if you don't cheat and write anything down. And I know that the more I played text adventures, the more effective I was at navigating a strange place. Uh, for instance, haunted theater. Uh, I played that in university, and I never would have realized that so much, you know, location was involved. So many different areas were involved in an old-style movie theater. My last game, I deliberately put in a section of the game that allows a blind player to play it. It's screen scraper friendly, so that it would read out loud the game to them and allow them to play. And that was done because I was approached by blind players asking me to do that. That's that. That was a. That was kind of a uh, an eye opener for me to make me think about uh, the necessity of doing that. And yes, I'm making a documentary in high definition video about blind players playing text adventures. <laughs> so um, there's a case where um, you know one of the things that really came out with when I was working on this was just the sheer mass of blind players who play text adventures and how important it is to them. And that caused me to make a really interesting decision, which is that the DVDs will be blind accessible. And that turns out that that's a nightmare, and so I'm doing that as well. Um, doing descriptive video is a very interesting environment. Um, there's not a lot that's done in it, unfortunately. It has to usually be funded. Uh, so, for instance, some major shows, like The Simpsons, are described. Um, there is what was called a blind accessible video uh, DVD that I bought that was sucky. So some of the people who I've interviewed are very specifically going to help me put that together. But that's, of course, more post-production, more time. But I really feel it's unfair to record somebody in an interview for a film they then can't enjoy. So I remember spending time with Austin, who's the guy who talks about not needing a lantern, and he... Uh, he and I were describing, you know, the difference between standard definition video and high definition video, and he felt really bad for everyone. He was like, what do you mean 720? That's horrible. But anyway, but he loves his Lord of the Rings DVDs because they're recorded so well, and he really gets a sense of the battle. So that's what really, you know, caused me to think about it. Now, the last gentleman in there is, is named Scott Adams. And what's interesting is that um, over time now, people think of Scott Adams as the Dilbert guy. But this is the guy who made text adventures back in the 70s who inspired many other people. And he actually told me how he used to get that guy's mail. Oh, sorry, that guy used to get all of his mail. So when Scott Adams first put his email address up, everyone went, whoa, whoa I loved your adventures. And then over time, over time, now Scott Adams gets things going, I love Dilbert. So there you go. That's how you know the time has passed. Um... So um, when I started to work on this, besides the people who were blind, I wasn't aware of, for instance, the fact that there were still people who were selling text adventures. Uh, I certainly wasn't aware of how deep the modern interactive fiction community goes. Um, there's a whole interactive fiction community that still exists, and there seems to sometimes be a, a markedness of surprise that this is the case. And I've been kind of embedded with them for three or four years. They are very clever people. Um, some are bitter, some are unbelievably intelligent. Um, there was a peak in this in the late 90s when they were really engaging the, each other into major events. Um, and what they did was they refined how text adventures are made. When we think of a text adventure, we often think of this thing where you load up and it says, here's a stick and here's a prompt, go. And now you know how the next four months will be spent. Well. What's moved in the interactive fiction community, and there's a difference between interactive fiction and text adventures, I found out, um, there's been something that's called the IF comp, as in competition. And what this is, is this is a yearly event in which people create text adventures that are meant to be played within a number of hours and completed. Think of short stories versus novels. And then you can kind of download one of these things, play it almost anywhere, and then solve it in about a day, or if you're me, about a month, and you don't really feel like you've committed to this crazy amount of time, so we've moved into the short story. Now, every once in a while, someone comes out of the darkness and just drops this massive whopper on everybody, and everyone goes, oh my God, and it's huge. But 
What's interesting about text adventures is the pure mass of testing that has to go on, if you think about it. Not only do you have to think about if the code runs, you have to think if the, gra of if the grammar is functioning, you have to think if the plot is coming along properly, if people are characterized accurately, if you describe something in the description, can a person manipulate it? These are all questions that come from writers. It didn't take me that long to figure out that I was making a movie about writers and the process of writing. So I have spoken to the Poet Laureate, um, Robert Pinsky. I've spoken to a number of other book writers, both um, linear and interactive. Um, I've made a little tiny kind of promo thing. This is more like a, not so much a test, it's more like a, um, at the bottom it tells you what they did. So what I'm interested in is clap if you know what the hell I'm talking about at the bottom. So that's your, there's your, there's your, your interactive part of this bit. It's interesting. It makes you do it twice. I hate you. I hate you. Anyway, so what I tried to do, like I said, was really try to expand uh, on tangents where things go. So it wasn't just a matter of like, well, I'm just going to interview five Infocom guys, two guys who did other adventures, and then call it a day, which would be a standard documentary. So yeah, I interviewed um, Ed Packard, who did uh, Choose Your Own Adventure, and he had input onto how these things went. I talked to actually not one, but three people who have doctorates in text adventures. It was just that Marianne Buckles got hers in 1984, so she was really ahead of the curb. In case you're wondering, she's now a massage therapist. Um, and was really not into being interviewed, so I was very happy that she finally agreed. Some people were just not up for being interviewed. Um, and that's fine. I have other people talking about why they won't be interviewed, and that's fine too. Um, I don't consider what I'm doing to be some sort of God-given crusade that enables me to burst into every person's life who I think of and have to make them talk to me. Although I do like it when they do. So um, one of the things that's mentioned in there is the real colossal cave. So I'm going to actually bounce over to that just for a moment because that was an interesting subset of this whole thing. One of the things that I was told very soon was that A, uh, adventure is based on a real cave, and B, I would never be allowed in it. And so the first one is true, but the second one isn't. Um, 
And the process by which I was able to be given access to climb through the actual cave that Adventure is based on is uh, an epic in itself. Um, the main reason why is because it's on national park land. Uh, we are blessed with a beautiful place called the Mammoth Cave System in Kentucky. It is the largest cave system in the world by far. No one's going to catch up to this thing. Hundreds of miles of caves. They're still finding new caves in it. And it's got everything from caves that have been carved such that they have stairs and railings and you can walk through them with your kids all the way to things that will kill you. So the person who started the adventure game, whose name is Will Crowther, uh, was a caver. And so he would do mapping surveys. And one of the last ones he did before he quit caving and moved to mountaineering was a system called the bed quilt system. And bed quilt is a specific cave system that was part of uh, an exploration that linked two major cave systems. So it has some amount of fame. But what it's more famous for is the fact that it is one of the most dense and compacted tunnel systems. So you have m enormous amounts of places you can go. Well, uh, months after going to that cave and mapping it and being with people and then having a slight falling out with the community, he then went off and was working at BBN and where he did some amazing work. And while there, he played some D&D &D and also got this idea in his head to kind of make kind of a cave-based system. One of the myths that's out there is that he created just a mapping system and then turned around and made a, uh, a, a simulator and then Don Woods made a game out of it. In point of fact, he had made a site, a pretty good game out of it, but it was based on real lore that cavers would know. So, for instance, the lamp had batteries, and there were um, you had food and water and keys. And the reason you had keys was because in caving systems in, the, in this country and other places, they put gratings on the caves. So you motherfuckers don't go in there and die. Because they're very paranoid about people who don't know anything going in and dying. So they try to be... You know, secretive isn't the word so much. They try to obfuscate how and where caves are located because they don't want people to just kind of, you know, pack a Twinkie and go in and die. So they have a grating, and the grating is located as far into the cave as a human voice can be heard yelling at the top of its lungs. So that way they can get by the entrance and go, are you in there? And the person goes, yeah, I'm in there. Sorry. And so this process of getting in there turned out to require that I go through the park system. And it required that I had to basically fill it out as if I was a film production company going into film. Film production companies are devastating to parks because they tend to break shit. Well, I'm a guy. And unfortunately, that's all the entries. It was like, so, you know, how many food service carts do you have? None. How many cranes do you have? None. What's your sound equipment? None. And it was like any other notes. And I wrote, I'm just a guy. Anyway, um, and I, I had my heart broken at least once. I was supposed to be there for one event, and they canceled on me. And it just turned out that like I had raised all this dust because they were trying to figure out how to get me in there. There were a group who were like, that's awesome. Let's have him do it. Another group were like, yeah, but we don't want him to screw things up. And so there was this big debate going on, and it was very involved. And I went anyway when it was canceled and hung out with the cavers. And they're unbelievable people because you see cavers have to crawl into places that are just unbelievable. So they tend to be older, they tend to be very experienced, and they tend to be built like fucking steel, right? And Flab Boy comes in, and um, they were very kind to me for that, for that approach, right? Because, I mean, I had no chance of fitting in some of these places if I, if I couldn't. So they, they planned things that way. Um, I was, uh, the, the bed quilt system is a moderate cave system. Um, so what I'm going to do here is um, play a little bit of a sequence about bed quilt because I would assume people here would like to see a little footage of the inside of the real Colossal Cave. Yeah, okay, one guy says, oh God, that's what I'm here for, that I'm leaving. Is this the right one? Let's find out. Yeah, it's got music. I'll have to narrate some parts because it doesn't make any sense otherwise. Runs 
My first experience as an adult playing adventure. When I sat down and said, okay, this is adventure. I remember playing this as a kid. My first experience was I got lost in the woods, got frustrated, and gave up. Well, when I joined the Cave Research Foundation and went out in search of Bedquill Cave, my first experience was identical. We got lost in the woods and came back without actually finding the cave. So the opening sequence in Adventure, wandering around in the forest, which seemed so pointless and so frustrating to me when all you wanted to do was find the cave, well, when I actually went to Kentucky and tried to find the cave with experienced people who'd been there before, um, we couldn't find it. And uh, that made that opening sequence of the game that much more important because I realized by withholding my discovery of Enter the Cave, it made it more magical. It delayed the gratification, meaning that when you found it, it was that much sweeter and that much more of an accomplishment. That's where the house used to be. It's since come down. That's where the keys would have been. That's where the water would have been. That's the brook by the little building. I don't know why it's doing that, but that's part of uh, us doing some photography next to the river. That's where the three inch slit is that goes into the end of the stream that you can't get into. And that's the entrance to Bed Quilt. So in case you're wondering, we didn't actually bring that lamp in there. You would never actually bring an oil lamp in there. That's my tour leader, Dave West sitting in the entrance, and as you can see, it's not a cave that you just walk in with a railing. Um, let me switch over to the second one, which has a little more footage of the inside. So, you are the wrong one. 2A, 2B, 2C. 2A, 2B. All right. I appear to have that one. Oh yeah, that's that's what I'm going to do right in front of all of you. There's a lot of porn on that drive. <laughs> Is it good porn? Is it unforgivable porn? I think it's good porn. All right, so anyway, let's go. Oh shit. Let's do that. Let's open up the network on the worst fucking thing ever made. That's awesome. All right. And I think it's called... Oh, and by the way, I mean, there's certainly things in here that are... Let's try him. Okay, so you're two. My apologies. My staff has failed me. Yeah. All right, good. We'll get a little bit of this in here. These gentlemen are now located in the Y2 room from Adventure. We're having some water. There's a very specific approach to all this. One of the things that um, I wonder if the film will properly show is the pure claustrophobia of being in caves. Uh, to be able to get from one location to another, this is um, one of the shots that I have of the bird room where the cage is, and it goes up quite some ways. Um, it was named the birdcage room by the original explorers. So it, he put a real bird in it. And then at the bottom, here's Peter Bosted, one of my other guides, having a nice meal. He's eating over an open bag. It's very bad to leave crumbs in these caves because you introduce new microbes to an, an environment that doesn't want them. Um, interestingly enough, caves actually have, you know, someone's going to walk in and go, what a fucking weird thing. They're showing a geology experiment. But anyway, so there's an 1877... Uh, graffitum. Uh, this is the Hall of the Mountain King. 
I had one of our expedition people, Bruce, walk through it to show its scale. So all of these things are kind of on one or another. Um, it, in, the whole place maintains a similar temperature all through. So it's basically a, a uh, um, uh, not a problem to come in during winter or summer or whatever. It's always going to be the same kind of average temperature. So it's actually not that hard to get through. Um, so when we did it in late November, it was okay. This is what remains of the axe from the game, um, which uh, has long ago since rotted. It was probably rotting when they first made the game, but in the 30 years hence, it's rotted even more. Up there, that's the entrance to the maze of twisty little passages. Uh, unfortunately, you have to climb up an amount that a fat guy can't get up there. You know, um, I, I call my other main guy, he was like an Iron Man version of Gandalf. I want to point out uh, something which may not be obvious. Except for Bruce, my basically model who walks through a lot of these caves in my shots, everyone else is between 55 and 60 years old. They are badass. Um, when I was in there, I started to make kind of a nervous joke about not being found and, and, and now people aren't going to find me and, and what's going to happen and da 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 da. And um, I had found out that every single one of them had done a body recovery sometime in their last years. Every single one of them had brought a dead person out. Not to find somebody, but to actually take a body out. So it was like, oh, okay. So one of the things that I have, which I no sense in me putting up right here. Um, Steve Moretzky, by the way, is a paragon, a, a, a shining example of how best to keep your own history. Um, every single scrap of paper, and I do mean every single scr uh, scrap of paper that he did related to one of his games, he saved. And he kept them in binders. So I have all the original, I have scans of original design notes for many of his games, going through various iterations, uh, what worked, what didn't, memos where they're arguing over points of the plot, whether or not they should have politics in it, whether or not they should have this phraseology, all this amazing stuff. And one of the things he kept, which I think was pretty interesting, was all of the sales figures for every Infocom game ever sold. So I've got the numbers. And it would surprise you to hear that the best selling of the game sold about 113,000 copies across their career. So, you know, we think of that early time of being a certain kind of way of living, and nowadays it, you might even expand it. But the fact is, the amount of people who had computers, or more accurately, the amount of people who paid for software, is actually a lot smaller than you would, you know, normally say now. Because now we're in a case where we just have, you know, you think of a successful website as one that's getting millions of people. That's a big ticket website. And back then, the top place was only having a couple tens of thousands. Um, so in terms of um, what am I trying to shoot for with the rest of this production? Well, uh, I do know it's probably going to be at least a couple DVDs. Um, the big thing that's happening now is that when you're working on something like this, and this is entirely self-funded, I'm the director, I'm the editor, I'm the light, lighting guy, I'm the asshole sound guy, I can't figure out who the grip is yet, but maybe it'll be me too. And so you have all sorts of things you have to be thinking about. So even though I'm editing, I have to be thinking about how is this going to come out. And the thing that's a realistic problem is that buying a DVD, buying hard stuff in 2008 or 2009 is not the same as it was in 2005. And it won't be the same as it was in 2000. It certainly won't be before that. So the question becomes, well, how are you going to sell it? And so right now what I'm currently gravitating towards, too, is the Trent Reznor model. Other people did it before him, them, and that's fine. They can take the flag later. But the fact is, is that his album that he released came under three different platforms. Downloadable, OK, Deluxe. He also produced Super Crazy Deluxe. And Super Crazy Deluxe, he made basically a million dollars in one day selling it that way. I like millions of dollars, but obviously I wouldn't shoot a film for f three years if I was out to become rich. I'd make a whole bunch of shitty films and force them at you lying all the way, but I ha I'm just trying to make a film where it's like, if you want it, you get it. So uh, for some of you or some people who are watching it, 
it's a disposable thing. They're not really that big into text adventures. It sounds like it's pretty funny. They, the gaming magazine said it might be fun. So for them, a five or ten dollar download um, from a site of the AV. No, I'm not going to fucking DRM it. You know, you know, I want just give me a goddamn you know 400, 500 meg MP4 of it, and I'm done. Right? That's what they want. Fine, I'll sell that to you that way. Some people want to have something on DVD. So I'll make a DVD version that has stuff. And then I'll have the Super Deluxe version. And the big question is, well, what's in the Super Deluxe version? And I'm still working on that. Um, uh, should I say this? Okay, well, I have a line into the guy who made the Star Wars poster to make my cover. We'll see if that happens. He's a little expensive. Um, and I have a few other people I'm working on things. One of the things I came up with, like for instance, was a code that goes into the packaging, and when you have that code and mail it to me, I'll call you and talk to you for an hour. You know, because one of the things that people have to understand, um, as I watch all of this, you know, various piracy versus blah 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 things, blah, 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 is that what it really comes down to is some stuff can't be sold anymore with the same sense of um, just uh, just no problem whatsoever. Like, we don't even have to worry about it. You will sell it, right? You know, I mean, it says something that, you know, people are buying food from that unbelievably shitty food vendor over there. But what are they paying for? Are they paying for the food quality and the amazing way those wings taste? No, they're, they're buying it because it's two feet away. You're paying, you know, 90% of that for the fact that it's right here. You're paying for its convenience. So people... They're not really caring about how do we really improve our business because it's like, it's food, it's here, buy it. And it's like, oh, done, eat. So when you're working on something like a movie, though, it's we've been working as an industry to make it easier and easier to distribute digital media. So if you produce digital media and go, no, 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 this digital media is special, and if you don't do what we write with it, we'll put you in jail for 15 years, people are like, you know, that's a little bit too abstract for me, dude. Sorry, Clang. So I don't really expect people to uh, 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 say, well, Jason Scott did it. Da, da, da. Although I might say, though, when the BBS documentary came out, I waited for someone to pirate it, and there was a group called Info Fallout, and I mailed them. They announced that they had pirated it. And I said, dude, it's like you stole ketchup packets out of the McDonald's, you know? And the kid started to talk to me. And he was like, wow, you're actually pretty cool. So they went back and they said, like, we're releasing what we've released so far, but we won't release his bonus features. You should go buy the movie. All right. And I have the NFO file framed on my wall, and it's nice. But, you know, my attitude about it was like, okay, that's just the way life is. And if you don't, if you want to play Fantasyland or if you want to throw money at the problem, then fine, you can do that. But there's a certain number of people who will never pirate your stuff. And there's a certain number of people for whom paying any money for any kind of digital product is a sin. And you just have to find the balance. And so you say, well, I'm a single guy. Hi. If you do this, you're hurting me, or you're not hurting me, or you're doing things to me, or whatever, but it's me. I'm not a company. I'm not whatever, whatever productions, da, da, da. I'm me. So people go, okay, well, fuck Jason Scott, but at least it's personal. <laughs> and that's fine. And other people go, like, oh, I want this thing, and that's fine, and, and it's up to me to come up with things that you can't uh, copy easily. So a phone call from me is a pretty organic thing. Now, granted, a lot of you would just call up my phone number. Um, and go, hi. But some people, they need that little bit of like, okay, well, now I have the right to bother this guy and talk in nanity for an hour. And that's fine. I think it's pretty cool. Um, on the BBS documentary, there's an Easter egg, which um, when you first put in all the discs, it plays some phone. That's my cell phone. And so every once in a while, I'd get this phone call, and I'd be like, hi, Jason Scott. And I'd go, oh, shit! <laughs> Hang up. I knew what that was. Um, so, you know, people, people, you know, some people did it because if you just hold your phone up to it, you know, if you have the right kind of phone and it's not like that much anymore, but you know, you hold the phone up and boom, it dials the phone and hooray, you you got me. So it was a cute little thing to stick in. I, I don't mind being contacted and I don't mind talking, obviously. So I'm a, I'm a very, very introverted type. Anyway, so, so anyway, so, so that, that that's kind of where I've been kind of going with that and. So I've really been focusing on, like, well, how many features can I fit into it? 
Um, so I've been speaking with text adventure authors to have copies of their text adventures on it. Um, I'll put other things that I've done on it. Um, it's going to be at least one main movie, one movie definitely about Infocom, one movie that's probably going to have some of that footage in it about going into bed quilt with more information there. Um, I'm probably going to do something on modern text adventures that's going to be more focused on them uh, and so on. So it's like I don't like, uh, as much as I don't want to admit it, it might be another three DVD production, but we'll see. Um, it would probably be, what I'm thinking is it's probably going to be, okay, okay, here's, all right. There's a, slip, there's a slight bias here, and that bias is fuck Blu-ray. And that's an interesting situation. Because uh, people are like, well, Blu-ray won. You should do it on Blu-ray. And I'm like, no, fuck Blu-ray. Blu-ray isn't even standard now. Everyone who bought a Blu-ray player is going to get fucked in about a year when they upgrade the spec. Unless you own a PlayStation 3. Um, you know, and so it's like, okay, yeah, so great. Sony won. Fuck Sony. So... The problem is, though, is Blu-ray has a lot of capacity and a lot of features and a lot of functions. And so I'm in this kind of weird state. So what I may do is do two DVDs where it's most of the DVD is in standard definition, but then it's got MP4s on it on another disc that lets you play them on your computer in high definition. Because it seems a shame to shoot it in high definition and make it so you can't see it in high definition. So, um, you know, so that, that's kind of what I'm trying to work out. And obviously in the downloadable content, you can get this. And I may have it that when you buy one, you get a code and you can download all the high def versions and da, 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 da. And it becomes a logistical nightmare, but it's not so bad. Don't cry for me, Argentina. But I'm going to do my best to make it so that you get what you want as fast as possible in the way that you should get it. And then you can do what the fuck you want with it and not be bothered by me. And make sure that it's all subtitled and make sure it's all got its, you know, everything else. So, so I'm, you know, I mean, I always say, you know, I want my movies, whatever production I do, um, is going to be one that I pick up that I would have been absolutely floored and delighted to have and go, oh, good, they did this. Oh, fine. Because that's the kind of mail I get. I still get fan mail every week about the BBS documentary. And it all comes down to, oh, God, thank you. Nobody understands me. Now my wife understands me. It's mostly used as a wife education tool. <laughs> it's very good for that. It's also very good for, um, um, you know, kind of a yearbook for some people. And it also kind of functions as this really interesting... Uh, I, I'm particularly proud of the art scene episode because I think that the ANSI art scene was going to just disappear and nobody would have known what anyone was talking about about that. So I was really glad to get all those guys together. Um, you know, I've already had a few people die. Uh, I already had one person die before I could... Two people! Sorry, I apologize. Two people died before I could interview them for the text adventure documentary. One of them uh, was the creator of Hunt the Wumpus, uh, who is now currently upside down in a cryogenic tank in Arizona. And the other one is uh, Thomas Deesh, who wrote um, Amnesia, which was a particularly good text adventure back then. And he also wrote a wide variety of dystopia poetry and the brave little toaster. <laughs> anyway, he was really awesome, and we have mail back and forth, but he committed suicide before I got a chance to talk to him, so what can you do? And no, it wasn't because he was talking to me. Don't think that. It takes a while. Oh, God, Vista. It must be great to live in a world in which I hate things that just show up like brands. Anyway, so um, what I've tried to indicate here is you know, that this is a subject that I care about and I'm working on it and um, that I want to do right by it, but right takes time. And that's part of why when I'm consumed with this thing 60 hours a week and I'm editing it and trying to get just the right hits, uh, as you saw in the BBS documentary, BBS documentary was about seven solid months of editing. Uh, this one is going to be something similar. And then, of course, like I said, I want this thing to be blind accessible. I want a person who is blind to enjoy it. And that's going to be some amount of work. Um, within the level, um, quick rant, fuck Joe Clark. Uh, Joe Clark is a gentleman who runs an accessibility website. And his he's considered the expert in, in closed captioning and subtitling. But his general approach is only I know how to do it right. Nobody knows how to do it right. So therefore, you should never even try. Fuck Joe Clark. I hate guys like that.
He's taken his time out to let me know that I can't make a blind accessible DVD. I sat in an office with somebody who told me, you're never going to get into Colossal Cave. That didn't work out either. So, no. No, no, we're going to be blind accessible. We're going to have everything that I said before, and I want to make this thing really good. But at the end of the day, it's about text adventures. So I understand this is not going to be everyone's cup of tea. That's why this room isn't fucking packed. Also, also by the way, I think everyone left last night. Like I was, a, 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 I'm, I use Twitter because Twitter is a really good way to find out what the world's thinking, assuming you think the world is a paranoid schizophrenic maniac. But you know, you get kind of a gist, and everyone's like, hey, I'm leaving. And I'm like, dude, the party's just beginning. The cool people. Yeah, you're still here. And in my heart. Anyway, so um, I never will pretend that this thing is for everyone. But I think that it'll be something that you'll be happy about, and you'll learn some new things about text adventures from. And believe me, I've learned way too much about text adventures these days. Uh, but you know what? At the end of the day, it's 2008. I started working on this in 2005. I registered the documentary website, getlamp.com. And yes, I have takelamp.com um, in 2002. So I knew I had an idea I might want to do this. And I regret not one minute of it. I regret not one second of it or any of my other documentary work. This has been the greatest journey of my life, has been to sit in an off-road vehicle with Scott Adams getting to his farm because it's snowed out so we can go interview him and talking to him about life or going to Steve Moretzky's house and hanging out with his family and having food and talking about what we're going to do with it or going to Mark Blank's house, Mark Blank, who every other Infocom person told me he would never sit down for an interview. And when I called him, he said, sure. And I said, oh, what's up with that? He goes, well, I think, I think you're it. So wonderful. Um, so, so for me, I don't regret one moment of this. So if, if nothing else from my talk, take some amount of heart if you're working on a project that nobody else understands. Because if at the end of the day you enjoyed it and you appreciated it, then you won. Anyway, I'll now take questions if there's any questions. What are we at, actually? We're at uh, what about 4? Four? 4.10. Good. I made it an hour and 10 minutes. That's short for a Jason Scott speech. Yes, sir? Uh, a couple years ago, when you talked about the BDS documentary, I remember you saying that your next one was going to be on Pinball Machine. Is that still on your uh, list of things to do? Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> All right. So after the text adventure documentary, assuming the text adventure documentary makes enough money and isn't a just, you know... I go from the glory of she's got to have it to the dismay of school days. Um, I'll start working on what I call the arcade documentary, which is a lie because I've already shot 30 hours of it. Um, and what it is is people go, so what's the scope of your arcade documentary? And I say, automaton salons of the 16th century through MAME. Egad. All right? So that's going to be one big motherfucker. I think, and, and that may be my last film. I mean, I don't know. I mean, if I sit here and I make a film every four or five years, like, wow, that was awesome. I'm 45. So um, I have interviewed people who did stuff for MAME. I've interviewed people who worked on pinball. I've got a scheduled interview with the guy who invented putting pinball flippers on the bottom of the field. Um, I've got people who um, have done all sorts of work in arcades. I've gone through some arcades. And people go, well, Jason, that sounds kind of drawl and mainstream and shit. But in f point of fact, I'm doing it about the places. In other words, like it's not just like, oh, boy, we're going to play Pac-Man Fever. And then people are going to go, this was awesome. Uh, it's going to be like, why do we as a people need to go into boxes full of electronic or mechanical things and make them amuse us? What's that, what's that urge? Why have we always needed that? And that's what I'm talking about. So mechanical museums, pinball, automatons, um, all the way up through. Why do the MAME guys work so hard to capture the experience of being in an arcade? What's so important about an arcade that they think that needs to be covered? So, yeah, I'm working on that. But at some point, and a lot of that is because the camera costs $6,000. And by $6,000, I mean $10,000. Uh, because when you buy the uh, HVX 200, it comes at six thousand dollars, and then you find out you need another four grand worth of um, accessories to make it work. 
And you got to say to yourself, Jesus Christ, ten grand. By my estimation, the BBS documentary cost me about twenty-five to twenty-seven thousand dollars to make, and here I am, right at the beginning, I'm already fifteen grand down between everything. And I'm like, oh, that's bad. So I'm like, I better make two movies. I'm going to amortize. And so I went there, and the answer is, Jason, why don't you rent? And the answer is, you're not thinking straight because you can't rent for three years. It's just not a good idea. So, you know, maybe I'll think that out in the future. But the problem is, is that when you're doing a documentary on such an obscure subject or sets of obscure subjects, you don't really have much time to plan. So it's like, I need this equipment. Okay, I got this equipment. We're going to go, and I'm going to interview this guy. So I interview, like, a guy who was the manager for Adventure International and then the guy who runs the IF Comp, and they're 200 miles away from each other. So I'm going to land in Atlanta, interview that guy, drive 200 miles, interview that guy. I have woken up driving. And... You know, drive back. I often use the um, the rumble strip as a snooze alarm. There's a tip for you long-term drivers. Um, so, so yeah. So the answer is yes. I'm working on the arcade documentary, but at the at the level and depth at which I work, I really have to concentrate on this thing. No, another question. Uh, person in the back. The what? Yeah, the Zork over IP. The Zork over, over Asterix? Yes. Probably not. Well, the problem is, is that I could give you a list of like every, you know, I mean, okay, how about this? All right, we'll strike a deal. Are you affiliated with it? Okay. You're just that big a fan that you're dismayed by its lack of public relations? That's pretty hardcore. Well, all right. Well, look, I mean, there's a chance that, I mean, I, I am definitely having to demonstrate that it's, it's moved to mobile phones and bizarre devices and that the incredible engineering ability of Mark Blank and Lebling and others to put Zork in such an interesting, the Z machine was such an interesting thing. The fact that it ends up in these other places will be portrayed. So among those things in which it is portrayed while somebody is talking about it, maybe I'll put Zoip in there. And then everyone will be happy and you'll go back and smile into your pillow. What? Okay, it took me a very short time to discover that there were blind folks. It took me a little bit longer to find the blind folks, um, which sounds kind of cruel and ironic. But um, the the uh, the actual point of fact is is that um, Austin Seraphin, which is the greatest fucking name ever in this documentary, Austin Seraphin um, contacted me first and was like. You know, hope you're going to do some blind stuff. Not, not so much, I hope you're going to do some blind stuff, because they never do that. They don't go, represent, blind, represent, seeing nothing. It's more about, like, um, embrace the blackness. They, and oh, oh, by the way, that's another myth that I didn't, I, dis I didn't discover, by the way, is that a, most, a lot of blind people can see shit. Just so you know. Like, they're born without retinas, or they can sort of have a vision thing, but they are so gone that they, all they see are moving shapes. So, in point of fact, for instance, um, Debbie, who's the uh, woman with the dog, um, I had to move the light because it was hurting her. Because her retina doesn't close. She has no iris. So, she can't stop the light. So, um, you know, she can see light, but it's not going to help her find things. And Austin can sort of see, um, like, a little bit of light. You know, he can, sh he can detect shifts in light. Um, he actually heavily advocates the use of drugs for the blind. Uh, so he writes stuff about inner light and being able to use your blindness to your advantage and so on. So he's also the creator of the BBS door Barney Splat, if you've ever played that. So there you go. Um, so, no, I discovered that pretty quickly, and then it was like, oh, here's somebody, and they never say, like, I'm blind. They're always like, da-da-da-da-da, you should do this, you should do this. It really helped me with my screen reader. And you'll be like, whoa, hey, wait, hello. So <clears throat> one, of my, one of my fun parts on one of my MUDs that I used to run uh, was there was a blind guy and a deaf guy who used to talk all the time. I always thought that was pretty awesome. They, otherwise, they wouldn't have hung out all that much. Um, if there's a, oh, and, yes? The mudding community is only going to be covered a little bit, only because I don't think it's fair. Muds deserve their own documentary, which is not going to be done by me. Please. I get a lot of suggestions like, Jason should do this documentary. But once again, everything I do is a four-year commitment. 
So it's like, do I really want to do that for four years? Like people are like, you should do a demo scene documentary. I'm like, the demo scene fucking hates me. You know, I mean, it's just because it's, it's a very young, vibrant community that's just like, hi, American, why are you bothering our European demo scene with your bullshit? You know, I got a lot of crap because the BBS documentary is very US centric. And it's just like, well, no, because I, 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 I was shooting 200 interviews. I'm not going to go to Europe on top of that and then somehow try to do that. I don't have any funding for that. So I said, look, all the footage is Creative Commons license. Just make your own documentary and then just cross out parts I was wrong and say, he's wrong. <laughs> Here's what the plot was. Jason is completely fucked. <laughs> but no, no. And so I don't, you know, whatever. So um, I've been asked, you know, why don't you do a Usenet documentary? Why don't you do a documentary on um, mailing lists? That was an awesome suggestion. <laughs> I'm falling asleep halfway through saying that sentence. But uh, anyway, so I, I, the main reason I went after the mud guys was more on the tangential side. So it was more like I got Richard Bartle, who created t uh, mud, and I got Jim Aspness, who created tiny mud. Uh, and here's your, here's your little tiny mud fact for you. You know, as you know, the original tiny mud default port was 4201, which was his office number. That's why he chose it. Other people were like, oh, it's this special number. It's only accessible. No. And Jim Asmus was a good example. He was like, why are you here? And I'm like, well, cause this, 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 what'd you think of this? Don't have an opinion. But he had some opinions on some things once I got him going. And, you know, I interviewed the creative Choose Your Own Adventure and I also interviewed his daughter because his daughter turns out to have been really influential in the marketing of it. And she even wrote one. And she says some amazingly funny stuff about choice and life and everything else. So it was more like that. I was like, oh, I ought to get the mud guys. How much of the mud guys did it? And, and Richard Bartle was very, you know, loquacious. I mean, he speaks professionally on virtual worlds forever. So a lot of the times he just locked into Richard Bartle mode and just told you about like what reality is and why text is, you know, what was it? What was his line? It was something like, you know, when you think of, when you tell a story, you tell a story in three time, in three um, places in time, what went on before the story, the telling of the story and where you live as you hear the story. Anyway, so that's what that is. So no, I wouldn't pretend to be a mud documentary, but mud guys are in it more to go like, oh my God, it's Richard Bartle. So more like that. Uh, any other questions? Have I decimated everyone? Sorry, I'm staring into the sun right now, you understand. Is there anybody else? Nope, picking your nose. Nope, nope, picking your nose. All right. Well, I guess that's all we need to talk about today. Thank you so much for your time. Hope you've had a wonderful time here at DEF CON. Thanks for sticking out all the way to Sunday. Oh, my God. And uh, see you at the awards ceremony.